Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Institution of Mechanical Engineers uh, webinar on an introduction to oil and gas produced water treatment. My name is Simon Rees. I'm the chair of the Upstream Oil and Gas Committee at the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, and I'll be posing the questions to our speaker afterwards. Our speaker today is Patrick O'Hara, Lambers and Filters, uh, ably assisted by uh, contributions from Alderley, and um, I'll uh, let him introduce himself in a minute. Good afternoon and welcome to this IMECI hosted webinar on produced water treatment. My name is Patrick O'Hara. I've been working in produced water treatment on the filtration coalescing side for over 10 years and have had experience in both offshore and onshore installations. Today we will be having a discussion on what produced water is, why we need to treat it, the various ways in which we can treat it, some of the challenges we face with the equipment we need to install to do that, and some of the wider challenges facing the industry as new oil fields are bought online. At the wellhead of an oil field, we have a number of different substances present that come out of the well. We have oil which is typically the main resource that we're after. Also present, we will typically have gas, which is also a useful and valuable material to get out of the ground. We will also find there water, typically with the oil. And we will also have sand produced from the well. Particularly with modern oil field development, we will also have water being injected to assist in the recovery of the oil from the field. Also, we will have other substances present in the water, which can include chlorides, carbon dioxide from the well, and also hydrogen sulphide. These are all challenging for the oil field equipment. Also present these days are chemical additives. These can be injected down the well to control things as foaming and corrosion inhibitors. And also, additionally these days, we will often have polymer chemicals being injected to assist in enhanced oil recovery. The first piece of process equipment that we come across is the three-phase separator or production separator. This piece of process equipment splits out the stream of oil, gas, water and sand into primarily a stream of water, a stream of oil and a stream of gas with the sand collecting in the bottom of the vessel where it is removed by jetting. All three of the fluid streams must now pass on for further processing since they are not pure and contain certain elements of the other substances present. Today we'll be looking just at what we do with the water stream. The produced water can either be disposed of, since it is not in itself generally valuable, either to the environment which is more traditional in an offshore environment where we are in the sea and we can then, once it's suitably treated, dispose of that overboard. Or we can put it down into a formation which is more typical onshore where we find a rock structure deep down underground where we can go and put that water into and safely dispose of it. This is more common onshore because the, dis the environmental requirements for onshore water disposal where this would potentially mix with drinking water are much more stringent than offshore where because of the diluting effect of the sea and that this is not drinking water the treatment requirements are not as stringent. The other option we have is to use the water for reinjection into the formation that we're actually taking the oil and gas out of. This is done 
to maintain the reservoir pressure and will also have requirements for treatment. The various substances that we need to take out of that water and parameters control include TSS, total suspended solids. That is the amount of solid contaminant with such as sand that we actually have in that water and we will also need to look at the particle size distribution because particularly during reinjection there may be requirements both to protect the reinjection equipment such as pumps and also in order to avoid plugging the formation. We also have OIW oil in water. This is the amount of free oil that is left in that water. Not so much of a problem with reinjection but it is a problem when we're disposing of into the environment as that there are requirements for typically for offshore disposal of between 10 and 30 ppm oil in water and for onshore that can be as low as 5 or below. Also the oil itself in water is actually a valuable commodity that we are trying to recover. So there is an economic incentive as well to recover that oil even if there is not a, an issue with injecting that back into the ground. We also need to look at TDS, total dissolved solids. These are the salts and ions present in the water, which will refer to its hardness or otherwise, and this can create requirements for either onshore or offshore to go and restrict and limit these. Additionally, there are requirements and controls on certain elements that are within that produced water for disposal, such as mercury. And also, another problem is norm or naturally occurring radioactive material. This occurs naturally in the Earth's crust and can build up in scale deposits inside the pipework, which then becomes detached and is present in the produced water. There will be environmental restrictions on what levels of background radiation we can dispose of into the environment, so that scale will need to be collected as part of the suspended solids where it can then be suitably disposed of in a safe environment. We adopt a multi-stage approach when separating the oil and solids, the two main challenges, from the water. During the primary stage we will drop from typically greater than 2000 ppm presence down to less than 300 ppm. Then in the secondary stage we will reduce that down to less than 100 ppm and in the tertiary or final stage we will reduce it down to less than 10 ppm on oil and solids. The reason we adopt a multi-stage approach is that the larger droplets and particles are much easier to separate for reasons we will go through later. And therefore the equipment used to do that is cheaper to install and cheaper to operate typically. So we will remove the bulk of the contaminant with those and then use more complex equipment to remove the more challenging oils and solids if required. We will go through now briefly the typical technologies employed and we will then look at all these in more detail later on in the presentation. As a, a primary stage we have skimmers which effectively are, are a large settling tank plate interceptors and often hydrocyclones which can also be used as a secondary stage of treatment after one of those primary stages. Other secondary sta technologies are dissolved air flotation and induced gas flotation. Then for the tertiary stage 
Typical technologies used here include cartridge filters, coalescers, and nutshell filters to reduce down to very low concentrations. To understand why the larger droplets are easier to separate than the smaller droplets, as we were looking earlier, we need to understand what the forces are upon the, the dispersed phase, which here we will look at as oil, but the same is true for the solids. The main way in which we separate the two phases is based upon their density difference. Typically, the oils will have a lower density than the water, meaning that they will tend to rise to the top, as was used in the three-stage separator earlier. How long we need to build that separator and the residence time required depends upon the size of those droplets. And the droplets experience a buoyancy force up due to their lower density, and as they move up through the water, they experience a viscous drag force down. The speed at which they move up is controlled by the viscosity of the continuous phase, water, the density of the oil droplet, and the density of the continuous phase, the water. For a given application, these will largely be set so the only variable we have is the diameter of that droplet. The settling speed given is proportional to the gravitational force, the density difference between the two phases, and the diameter squared. This is because the driving force is proportional to the diameter cubed, while the viscous drag force is proportional to the droplet diameter. Therefore, size matters here, as the larger droplets are much easier to separate for any technique than the smaller droplets. The simplest of equipment that we use here is the corrugated plate interceptor. This is much like the first stage separator in that we use a large tank with flow through that, tr that tank, only now we introduce a separation device here, which is corrugated plates inclined to the tank. As the water flows through these plates, the distance that the phases have to fall or rise to separate is reduced. Therefore, the oil droplets are trapped and then rise up to the top, whereas the solids settle down into the troughs and then drop off at the bottom, therefore achieving a higher efficiency in separating smaller solids and oils than we could have achieved with just the tank alone. The next technique which we use, which we use in hydrocyclones, is centrifugal separation. We are all familiar with the principle of a centrifuge, where if you rotate the fluid rapidly, the heavier substances will fall to the bottom, or the outside, and the lighter species will be drawn into the inside under the action of centrifugal force. So if we can get our fluid to spin, we induce a force and an acceleration on it. Effectively, what we're doing is we are cheating the gravitational side of that equation. We are increasing the effective gravitational force, therefore the effective settling velocity, allowing us to achieve a separation in a much quicker time. Hydrocyclones come in two different varieties, de-oiling and de-sanding. In de-oiling hydrocyclones, we are removing a rejected stream of oil from the centre of them. 
in a desanding hydrocyclone, we are removing the more dense sand from the outside, allowing the water to continue. Hydrocyclones are popular equipment offshore because they have a compact size due to their low residence time and have no moving parts and have no electrical power consumption requirement. However, they are more expensive to install than some technologies due to the fact that they need to be made from fairly exotic materials to handle the erosion and corrosion problems that exist from the high velocities within them. And additionally, they do require a reasonable amount of, of differential pressure across them in the region of 6 to 7 a bar, depending on the type of hydrocyclone. Now, this is not typically a problem on most applications as there is sufficient wellhead pressure retained within the produced water that does not need to be maintained, particularly if this is, water is then being disposed of overboard. The next principle which is used in dissolved air induced gas flotation is the principle of flotation. Here we bubble gas through our produced water which then becomes attached to the oil droplets. Now the gas being significantly less dense than the water we now reduce the effects of density of those oil droplets which means that they will now rise faster to the top in the induced gas or dissolved air flotation system then we will have the gas being forced down into the produced water which will then result in the layer of oil and solids rising to the top where that can then be skimmed off. Dissolved air flotation can be used where there is no gas present within the produced water and induced gas must be used where we have gas present as we cannot have a mixture of gas, flammable gas and air. The compact flotation unit is an increasingly popular option offshore where there is a constant pressure to reduce footprint and weight. This is based on similar principle to the induced gas flotation, only here we are using a gas adductor within the compact flotation unit to induce the gas bubbles within the produced water while also imparting a spin on it. So this combines the principles of centrifugal separation and flotation to produce a compact unit that has no external power requirements and a small footprint and weight ideal for offshore installations. The coalescing process is an, another approach we can use when trying to separate small droplets. Here we use a fibre matrix either in a cartridge form or as a pad to intercept the flow as it goes across it and the smaller droplets coalesce within the matrix to become larger droplets. This process works as the smaller droplets of oil become attached to the fibres and then as they become more amalgamated they will then reach a stage where 
they separate off and continue downstream. While this is not a separation process in itself, what we have achieved here is to take the small droplets and turn them into larger droplets which can now be separated with the same technologies that we used previously. A typical coalescer design which can be vertical or horizontal. Here we look at a horizontal design where our flow enters at the left hand end where we have the coalescer cartridges in this instance which take the small droplets of oil and turn them into larger droplets. The flow then proceeds through a settling section where the oil will rise to the top and while the water is then taken out from the bottom of the vessel there is an oil collection boot at the top where the oil will become trapped it's level controlled and then removed to be returned typically to the first stage separator. The nutshell filter is a bed type filter where we pass the produced water down through a bed of crushed walnut shell material. As it passes through the walnut shell material, oil is absorbed onto sites on the surface of the crushed walnut shell where it is trapped. A solids are trapped within the matrix of the bed. While traditional nutshells are most common onshore, offshore we increasingly see synthetic or engineered nutshell medias which can offer much higher absorptive levels and allow higher throughputs. These are used offshore where space and weight are a constraint since space and weight are not the best aspects of nutshell filters due to the low flux rates which we must flow the water through. We regenerate the nutshell bed when it can absorb no more oil or if it is blocked by solids by reverse flowing it with a mixture of water and air which will free the traps of solids and strip the oil from the nutshell. The absorptive principle yeah, is that the oil is absorbed onto the surface. This is a chemical process and so solids are trapped typically down to about 10 to 20 micron within the structure which is then freed up by the reverse flow during regeneration. Polishing or guard filters are cartridge type filters which can remove solids down to 2 microns and below. These are available in a variety of different types including pleated and depth type filters which typically used where we need to get down to, to below 50 micron as a cutoff point. They are disposable single use items which means that we have an operational expense there in terms of replacing the filters which depending on the process will need to be done from a matter of a few weeks to six months or more. The advantage of cartridge filters is that they have a fairly small footprint and weight. They are very efficient and can remove solids that cannot be removed by other methods and they are also the piece of process equipment least sensitive to upset conditions. But that is if something changes upstream in the process then they will still meet their removal efficiency requirements. This is why they're very useful as a final stage, hence known as guard filters, because if upstream equipment fails or the process changes, then downstream equipment or disposal environmental requirements will not be breached. 
So while we will aim to remove the majority of the solids with our upstream equipment, the polishing filters are there in order to ensure that that final specification is met. While they could perform the entire task on the, their own, they are not a particularly op economical way of achieving the bulk separation. A brief look at the mechanisms of filtration is useful to understand some of the phenomena we see within cartridge filters and produced water applications. Filters are often thought of as a simple sieve which separates particles above a certain size and allows through particles below a certain size. While this is true of certain types of filter, typically the coarser filters, 100 microns and above, where often we will have a simple mesh surface. The types of filter that are used during tertiary separation stages have more complex structures. That is that they are a matrix of fibers which will trap deformable particles and particles where not every dimension is above the stated micron or removal rating. This is normally of a benefit since we will remove more of the solids and the fines and we can trap more contaminant within the structure than we could trap on a simple surface. Oil adsorbent cartridges are also used as a tertiary stage. These operate on the same principle as the nutshell filter. However, they cannot be regenerated, therefore they are a single-use disposable technology. These have many of the advantages of a cartridge filter for solids removal in terms of low capex, a compact footprint and weight, and an insensitivity to process upsets. These are not used typically on larger installations. However, where there's a small amount of produced water to be treated, these are an economical means of achieving that separation or as a final guard stage in case of process upsets. And these end up some of the technologies that we typically employ. However, there are also challenges that we see within produced water treatment. And these can be caused by the oil and solids interaction. As we see here, this is removed, being removed from inside a cartridge filter installation here where we see that what we are trapping here is a mixture of oil and solids. This is a significant challenge for any separation equipment since we are expecting to separate discrete solids and that the oils will then pass through. We now have a mixture of the two which can result in very difficult separation since this can blind the surface of a filter and also settle and cause interference in the operation of other equipment. So we see here a sludge found within a hydrocyclone installation here, which also forms due to the interaction between anti-foaming agents and the oils. The factors affecting the technology that are actually selected for an individual installation are quite varied. The things we need to look at as engineers are the produced water specification. That is, what is in the oil that is going into our treatment plant 
and what specification does the water need to make at the end. We need to look at what flow rate, that is what total volume of water we are treating every hour, both at the start of operation of the field's life and also towards the end of operation of a field's life. This can vary quite significantly where we're injecting water. In the early stages, we can often have a water cut, that is the amount of water in the oil, of only 10% or less, and towards the end of a field life, this can be as high as 90%. Therefore, the flow rate that the water treatment plant has to handle will change significantly during their life of that asset and field. Therefore, the process equipment we select needs to be able to handle this turn down or reduction in flow, particularly important for equipment such as hydrocyclones, which require a specific flow rate relative to the number of cyclones present in order to get the correct separation efficiency. Therefore, we will need to build flexibility into that process equipment or choose process equipment such as plate separators or cartridge filters where their performance in terms of removal efficiency is independent of the flow rate or improves with a reducing flow rate. We also need to look at the challenges particularly offshore as a lot of developments increasingly are of a vessel motions where we have a floating installation and its effect upon a liquid-liquid separation process and also any requirements for remote operation as increasingly small platforms remotely operated are tied into larger developments. So there we need the technology not to require regular human intervention since that will typically need to be helicoptered to the installation. Also, the potential for future tie-ins, as we see marginal fields being developed by tying them back to existing processing installations, be they floating or fixed. So it's important to look at what processing requirements would be if any nearby known marginal fields were to be developed later on and if the economic cost or technical challenges of incorporating that flexibility are not too great then that is a factor to consider in the design planning for the future. Offshore but not onshore the footprint and weight how big and how heavy the equipment is is a significant factor since this both increases the cost of the support, be that the size of the vessel or the complexity and weight of the jacket, and also we need to look at the balance between a capex, that is the amount of money we spend on our installation and the equipment, and also what the costs are operationally and the balance between that. We also find sometimes that the more expensive equipment in terms of capital expenditure offers a lower operational expenditure but is only viable where we have high flow rates, whereas other technologies are better where we have a low flow to, to treat. The technology selection lemma extend, extends also to materials that we use. There are a number of common materials that we use within produced water treatment equipment. These range from carbon steel, the most common, through standard austenitic stainless steel or grade 316 which offers resistance to corrosion from a normal pr produced water with low salinity 
and no hydrogen sulfide present through the duplex stainless steels which offer improved resistance to sour water and the super duplex 25 chrome stainless steels which offer resistance to seawater. At the very top we have the nickel alloys which are used where we have very severe potential corrosion issues where we have high temperature produced water from the well with high levels of chloride and souring present. These materials increase in cost but also in corrosion resistance. There are ways we can get round this by adding in a corrosion allowance to a less corrosion resistant material or we can use a lining in our vessel. However, these approaches also have their downsides as linings can fail and adding a corrosion allowance adds weight. So we need to look at the total cost factors when we are specifying the materials for our process equipment. If we use CRA or corrosion resistant alloy, we offer a significant weight saving, not just in the equipment itself, but then in the weight and cost of the platform which must support it offshore. So we see the use of corrosion resistant materials more often offshore than onshore, where onshore that is not so much of a factor. Also there is a reduction in the risk as corrosion resistant alloy equipment will not fail if properly chosen. Whereas when we have a corrosion allowance or a protective lining that will need to be inspected and could potentially fail as an unseen or unmeasurable point leading to production shutdowns, hazardous circumstances and ultimately expense for the operator. This lack of need for inspection and maintenance also leads to a lower operational cost in terms of labour and also the use of equipment. Combined with the future flexibility, if we use a slightly overspecified material of being able to handle changes later on in the field's life, if we decide to inject seawater into an installation where that had originally not been selected. So there are many benefits to using a corrosion resistant alloy and as an engineer we should always consider the hidden costs of accepting material with limited or incompatibility with the process fluid. Thank you very much for listening and I will now invite any questions. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Um, right, uh, just a couple of um, reminders before we do the, the, the question. Uh, firstly, uh, use the submit question um, box on the right hand side of your screen to send something through. I, I get a whole list of them here, which I will then um, choose, choose the, uh, the most common or the, the, the most interesting ones to pass on to Patrick. And um, one question that always comes up and has already come in um, on whether or not the present the slides will be available. Just a reminder, the slides won't be available, unfortunately, uh, in this occasion, but the recording of this webinar will be available on demand on the IMECI website. Right, so uh, Patrick, thank you very much indeed for that. Very thorough and uh, wide reach, like, uh, reaching uh, presentation. Very interesting stuff. Um, a few things uh, you didn't cover that people have picked up on. What's the future for subsea treatment of produced water with subsea processing, subsea wells, and entire subsea installations being envisaged? Well, Simon, it, it is an absolute desire of the industry to be able to process water subsea, particularly 
with the ultra deep water developments because currently a lot of water is being pumped up with the oil being processed and often being sent down for reinjection or other seawater is being processed and sent down so if either seawater or produced water be processed subsea there's a huge market for that but there are a number of quite serious challenges to doing that uh, primarily there's the external pressure that far down limits the practical equipment size below that of a lot of the separation technologies there's the challenge of not being able to actually readily get to the seafloor to provide maintenance which limits your technologies to those which are capable of operating effectively unmanned and without much intervention so that there's it's an area that a lot of companies are looking at but currently it's it's only fairly crude technologies are available and certainly only suitable for reinjection of the water uh, and not being able to get down to the the required oil in water levels for actually disposal into the water at the seabed. So any any water treated that way, you, you couldn't re or you could only reinject, you couldn't release into the surrounding seawater. Yeah, you, a current technology only allows reinjection, and then only really where fine solids aren't an issue because cartridge filters are really needed to get down to the sort of levels needed to protect reinjection pumps and there it's a disposable technology so you need to go down to the seabed and change out those cartridges periodically which dramatically adds to the cost when that's a couple of thousand meters down and how would that compare with a top size offshore installation but the, the the operational issues onshore versus offshore we're dealing with things like cartridges and nutshell filters uh, nutshell filters yeah o off offshore creates different challenges both on equipment selection and Operation, particularly, that's more problematic offshore because any waste material needs to then be taken back onshore for disposal, which adds to costs there. Also, the costs of providing personnel offshore are significantly higher than onshore. So the drivers for offshore technology are effectively to have a compact system and to have one that requires minimum of operator intervention. With onshore, those considerations aren't so much of a factor. But one of, one of the interesting benefits offshore is that the actual systems tend to be a lot more integrated. So an entire facility will largely be under the control of one party in terms of whether or not something they're doing on water injection is having a knock-on effect on the produced water treatment. Whereas onshore, it tends to be much more siloed between the various injectors and processors of water. So they have a tendency to care more about their own part of the system, which can create challenges for the water processors since the, they have no direct control often over the quality of the water that they get or certain changes that are made that then have knock-on impacts on them. Okay. Oh, we've got another question here, um, also I suppose related to offshore, um, about the sensitivity of different technologies to vessel motions. Yes, certainly that, that is very much a factor, uh, particularly with such things as the three-phase separator, corrugated plate interceptors, and and then with dissolved air flotation as well. You need to look at the design of of the internals there to prevent sloshing and to prevent mixing there so it, it, it does tend to favor their t technologies which are less based on settling and more based perhaps on an inertial separation such as a hydrocyclone or a cartridge type technology which is insensitive to vessel motions or any sloshing effects and another question here on uh, problems associated with flaring of gas well, that's really a separate side is issue rather than the, the produced water treatment because any a gas which is evolved from the produced water will then be sent for treatment. Typically these days, the gas is always considered a valuable resource and is compressed and sent onshore. The, the small amount of flaring that you do typically see from an offshore installation is just the pilot flare, 
which is there so that if they need to suddenly release gas uh, due to a operational failure, then that will ignite rather than staying in the environment and then detonating. Yes, I, I came up recently, I think, with an onshore um, issue we were looking at where um, people queried onshore flaring, but it's, it's there as a, as a safety issue, really, as a safety requirement. It's not something that yeah. uh, operators want to do or, or regularly do. Um, are there, another question coming in, are there significant differences between produced water treatment for a gas terminal? Well, gas op operations tend to not evolve as much water. Um, basically, w water tends to be, in terms of volume, more of an issue with much more of an issue with oil. You do get a small amount of water typically produced with gas. Now that's a lower volume, but it it tends to be more difficult to treat because it can be higher in uh, a chemical concentration. So that so that's really a separate separate sort of a subject that looks at different technologies which are ideally suited to low volumes, and that's often uh, concentrated and, and, and then sent onshore for treatment with the residual solids. Now, some of those residual solids, you, you mentioned norm, and I remember reading recently that uh, the, the norm material produced by uh, well fluids is actually less radioactive than a banana. Um, is, that, is that the case? Yes, that is very much the case. The actual the radiation levels from norm are much lower than you get in parts of the country, but very, very similar in that respect to a lot of nuclear industry requirements where the, the standards are so stringent that effectively you're not allowed to dump stuff into the environment unless it's got only a fraction of what the natural background radiation level would be. But the regulations dictate that, so it does need to be effectively completely eliminated and disposed of in a so-called safe way, d despite the fact it's not really a hazard at all. Yeah. Uh, now, we've got a question here, the, uh, similar in a way, environmental uh, effects of disposal produced water in offshore situations, um, which I believe you can, obviously you can re-inject produced water, but it can also be dumped over, overboard. Yes, it can and typically is a dumped overboard once it's been treated down to a very, very fine level, perhaps 10 to 30 ppm of oil. Now, the environmental standards are set by local regulators and they will be monitoring and the fines are very significant for, for any oil companies that breach those environmental standards combined with the reputational damage uh, that will be done to those oil operators. So there is a huge incentive for the oil operators to ensure that they do comply and they are very, very strict on their monitoring and they will close down operations if they are going to be in breach. Uh, um, a lot of recent developments have been on heavy oil. Uh, how do you deal with heavy oils, particularly uh, thinking here about uh, filter cartridge systems, which presumably struggle particularly with, with, with heavy oil situations. Heavy oils create a lot of their different challenges. One of the, the real challenges is, is if your oil is quite similar in density to water, because as, as we saw during that presentation, a lot of the technologies that we use, particularly for bulk separation, uh, rely upon a density difference, and if you don't have that, then th that introduces a real challenge there. Uh, dissolved air flotation will still work because you're altering the density, but inertial separation won't. The cartridge filters will work on solids of removal, but the viscosity is a challenge. Um, you can heat, heat the water and oil up for processing, which makes that easier, but there's an energy cost associated with that, and then creates a real challenge for the polymer cartridges, which then necessitates looking at other polymers, which then adds to cost as well. But yes, a real challenge there and an emerging market. Um, back to the environmental question, there's uh, quite quite a few of these, and this is related, but um, it might be worth picking up. Um, which industry standards must be followed uh, for the design of treatment systems? Uh, and I, I doesn't say whether it's offshore or onshore. I know there are different standards, so if you Possibly cover both. 
sorry, the, 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 what standards for the whole produced what, what, water treatment? Yes, what environmental standards, what, what industry standards cover the... Um, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the environmental standards tend to be specific to each country. Each country will have, for its waters, uh, um, a, a written set of standards as to what oil in water, what solids in water, what other chemical levels can be disposed of into the environment. And that, and that isn't just specific to the oil industry. That will cover any any industry will be set limits for what can be disposed of into the environment. And that will change whether it's going into the water table or, or going offshore. And that's set by those local regulators considering local fisheries, uh, the local wildlife, tourism and all on all those factors there so it, it's it's set legally at a national level and i believe they're much stricter onshore than offshore yeah much much stricter onshore but because they're disposing of effectively into the water table whereas offshore you're disposing of it into water that's not suitable to be used as drinking water without much further treatment such as desalination. So it, it's, there's not, not a human health consideration there. Uh, another question here about uh, gas systems. Um, gas treatment in LNG, uh, how, uh, what, what equipment might you use for, a, for an LNG plant or something that's going into an LNG plant? What are the issues there? Well, in LNG, again, we, we don't particularly have a huge amount of produced water. So we've got any water that's produced with the gas from the wells, that would then be re removed during the dehydration process and that's relatively small amount of water treated. Uh, then once we're actually liquefying, we've already re removed the water there. So, so, so it, it's not such a big area just because the ratio of water to hydrocarbons is completely different. You know, we, we can see a end of life of an oil field, perhaps getting to 90% water cut, that's the amount of water coming out with the oil. So effectively, we're pumping water through the ground to, to remove oil. So that's why it's a, it, it's a particular area where the concern with oil, there's a, it's a huge application with, with gas, not so much of an application, really. Yeah, now that sort of leads on to a, another question here about produced water flow constants when the well is producing, which as you say, it isn't generally water cut increases as, as time goes on. But um, yeah. how, how uh, is the maintenance ability of the process to cope with unit failure built into the various processes? So uh, presumably this is addressing issues such as um, uh, redundancy, maintainability. Oh, well, absolutely. You need to consider the whole um, life cycle of that field. So certain technologies, obviously, Effectively, a gravitational separation settling, you need to design those for end of life. Um, whereas with hydrocyclones, you, they will want to be able to increase that capacity. Because uh, if you design them for the end of life, then when they're only running at 10 to 15% of that flow, they won't actually be effective. So effectively, the, the vessel will be designed with space for sufficient new cyclones to, to be installed there. And it's, it's one of the issues is what, particularly future tie-ins these days, we're seeing offshore a lot of individually marginal or non-viable fields that are being discovered being tied back into, say, a floating installation or a platform. So when designing these facilities, we may, we may want to keep future flexibility under consideration there in terms of if if future water injection is required or if there's water injection of those assets, then are we going to have the flexibility to be able to handle that? And the challenge, particularly offshore, is that there's very little additional space or weight allowance, typically on platforms or, or floating installations. So the chances of being able to retrospectively install equipment can be very, very limited. Well, in terms of... well. It's, we're, we're, we're dealing here with produced water in the in in the oil field sense, so it, it, it's it's not really a, f a factor on fast moving vessels. If I'm, I'm not perhaps understood that question correctly, there. Uh, I, I think it's presumably about uh, the nowadays on fast vessels. Um, environmental concerns mean that they, yeah. they treat the water on the vessel. 
Uh, yes. It's most of that is either filtration based or reverse osmosis based. It's, uh, yeah, ab absolutely. We'd be, we'd be looking at technologies there that are completely insensitive to any vessel emotions, are very, very compact, and are not having to deal with big volumes. But the they, suitable technologies change very rapidly once we start looking at a low volume of water, per perhaps a couple of cubic meters an hour, versus the eight to nine hundred cubic meters an hour plus we can be processing offshore with or onshore with a um, an oil field produced water application so it it's as you say reverse, reverse osmosis technologies and cartridge filters and even for removing oil absorptive cartridge filters there offer a compact solution because and you're not dealing with a big volume of water you're looking at a system that's compact and relatively cheap to install, less concerned about the OPEX per barrel or, or per cubic meter treated. Mm. No, I know that um, going back, if, if they are looking at uh, gravity separation techniques on a, on a fast vessel, um, the, the use of battles is widespread for the oil and gas industry to protect against slotting motions and yeah. make sure you don't have the damage internal to keep the uh, keep the three phases roughly in the place they're supposed to be in heavy weather. Um, another question that's come in here from my heart, actually. Um, does the role of composites offer a weight saving? Absolutely. This is a, a very, very broad mechanical question that the, the entire, particularly the offshore industry, is very, very interested in. Is are composites suitable both for pressure systems, so that's the basically the, the entire processing system, not just the, the water treatment system, and also for structural components. The, the, there is a use of, um, particularly on seawater systems, uh, glass fiber reinforced polymers are used, but they are very much limited in terms of what sort of pressures, and they're not favored for hydro, hydrocarbon service because there's limited experience with them on those critical applications. And the vast majority of industry design code standards, both structural and pressure equipment, are based around ductile materials. And using a brittle material uh, would require a whole level of um, research safety analysis. And it, it, is, it is something that, again, there's a driving force for introduction of, that there, there are a lot of barriers in terms of international standards and also acceptance by the insurance industries. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd like to add my own comments on that one. Um, we've, we've looked at, uh, at helping a couple of companies, uh, water treatment companies, water separation companies, who want to try and uh, use composites. And the, uh, the two issues that came up were obviously the necessity of having vessels on offshore uh, installations fire rated and the, uh, the lack of understanding about the implications for uh, separation, separation professional that's, um, that's made of composites. But actually, the, the biggest problem was um, the fact that they, they prefer to use very high pressure, high temperature steam for cleaning uh, during turnaround. And um, mm -hmm. they, uh, they, they weren't rated at high enough temperatures to cope with the steam cleaning. They were fine at the operational temperatures, but not at the steam cleaning cycle. So, as you say, I think there's a lot of scope there for weight reduction using composites. But uh, there's still some, some hurdles. Um, well, I think we're just coming to the end now, looking at the time. Um, so still plenty of questions there. If anybody else wishes to, to ask questions, then please get in touch with me by the IMFP. And I'll pass them on to Patrick. And um, thank you very much indeed for joining our session today. I hope it was useful. There's another webinar tomorrow, I believe, as part of a regular series put up by the IMFP. Please keep in touch and uh, hope to hear from you soon. Thank you very much.